All right, everybody, this is Ross. So we finally have that video I am so, so excited for. We've put a lot of work into this particular video. I've grew out about 50 different types of tomatoes this year. Some of which you see in front of me here have been made into sauce. We made individual batches of sauce made out of the individual varieties of tomatoes that we decided to grow, particularly for sauce. All in an effort really to find which tomato actually makes the best sauce or makes a really good sauce. Uh, is it the San Marzano who makes the best sauce as everyone seems to claim and just assume is the truth? Or maybe there's uh, actually something else here that I really like. Maybe there's something different. And maybe there's something that beats the San Marzano. So before we actually do this taste test, I love to show you guys the plants. Uh, we'll just look at them for a couple minutes. We'll come back in here and we'll do our little taste test. All right, you guys, so here are the plants. And uh, we have a lot of tomato plants in a very small space. I've been kind of talking about this all year where we're growing a lot of the plants vertically with the help of these trellises. We have um, T-posts that are driven into the ground with these PVC T's and then a um, EMT pole that has gone through both of the T's here of PVC. And then from those poles, I just hang some tomato twine. And then that tomato twine is then tied to a stake down here at the bottom. And then as the plants grew this season, I tied them around the, uh, or I wrapped them around the tomato twine. And as a result, I was able to grow a lot of tomatoes. I was just got so much food out of this small space. I mean, the, the plot that we're growing in here, this is my heat loving and some, uh, sun loving plot here that's only 17 feet deep and 10 feet wide. So in this small space, I was able to grow so much food and the tomatoes are just, they're still going. Here's actually our peppers that produced a ton of peppers this year. The eggplants are the same thing. And what I'm noticing obviously is that I've been, I've been doing this method for years, but we had a lot of plants in here really crammed in. And of course, some of them ended up getting disease. A lot of the plants that I really would have liked to have had more time to maintain, I just did not. But you can see, I mean, these plants have been doing wonderfully. They just continue and continue to produce. This is a very good one here. Very good cherry tomato that's similar to black cherry, which is my favorite. And it produces such a great flavor. Here's one called um, Blonde Kopchkin. And then we have um, also some bigger salad types, even beefsteak types that still continue to produce. This is only one planting of tomatoes. I did not succession plant. Even though now we're in October here in the Philadelphia area, they just keep going. They don't stop as long as they can remain disease free and they are indeterminate. They will continue to grow and continue to put out new tomatoes. Of course, some of them may split, but that's unfortunate. One of the things I really wanted to highlight out of this plot in regards to the paste tomatoes is that there's a tomato here, a type of tomato that is sold a lot in nursery catalogs. It's labeled as typically an Italian cherry tomato, an heirloom that's really good for sauce. Maybe it's good for drying, maybe it's good for canning, maybe it's good for, you know, um, extending the season. And you'll typically see them. I have about four or five of these that I attained this year and grew this year from seed. And they all, they're all very, very similar. I wonder if the sauce is gonna taste any different, but just tasting them, uh, picking them off the vines and eating them, they're all extremely similar. And the way you can tell is that they're red, but at the bottom is this really small little, I don't know what you wouldn't want to call this, nipple or something. And this is a really good indicator, I guess, of identifying those particular Italian heirloom tomatoes. And to me, uh, it just seems like one of them of the five or six, however many it is that I grew, I'm sure one of them is very good and deserves a spot, but it doesn't make sense, I think, to grow all of them. You know, rather than growing something like San Marzano or Speckled Roman or Orange Banana, Amish Paste, they're all pretty distinctly different. Whereas the four or five of those, like, 
This one here I think is called Frank's Iranian. I had another one over there called Pianolo uh, del Vesuvio. Um, there's other ones, even the Principe Borghese, I think, is one of them. The uh, Grappoli di Inverno is another. So essentially, what I'm trying to get to you guys is that, yeah, it's nice to have these types. Maybe they are going to be different when I taste this sauce, but I don't really know. And I just wanted to highlight that as we go into this particular tasting. All right, so let's get this started. All right, you guys, so you could probably tell just by looking at some of these sauces that some of them are really range in colors. And that's really what I wanted to do. I wanted to try to grow different tomatoes that were four paste um, that were of a different color because usually the color corresponds pretty well to a particular flavor, especially in the world of tomatoes and really in the world of most fruits and vegetables, those colors bring different flavors with them typically. Now, one of my favorites, and really actually my favorite tomato uh, for paste is this one right here, and it's orange. It's bright orange. Um, it's very fruity. It's called the orange banana tomato. And uh, this was really described in Amy Goldman's book. Um, and a few, uh, the Seed Savers Exchange even mentions it, I think, on their website, that this really does create some fantastic sauce. And I didn't really want to believe it, that an orange tomato could possibly create a very good sauce, but it does. And uh, I'm just going to try it for you guys here, as this is the first one that I'm kind of probably judge them all against. And I'll show you the sauce because we did not, on some of these, use olive oil. I just kind of threw them in a pan just to make this quick and easy. I threw them in a pan, didn't use olive oil, didn't use sauce or salt, excuse me. And that's going to dramatically, I think, impact the flavor because some of them I did use olive oil and some of them I did use salt. So it's a little tricky. We'll see, I guess, if some of them need salt or something, I have olive oil and salt right here. I'm not going to eat them on something. I'm just going to eat them straight. You'll also notice that the seeds are very present in here and also the skins. I did not throw this through a food mill. I basically cut these up to, just for my sanity sake. I just basically cut these up, threw them in a pan, um, and tried to cook them down into sauce and do that as quickly as I could, can them, label them, make sure that everything was, you know, I was doing everything uh, so that I wasn't making any mistakes. And then that's kind of what we're at right now. So that's what we're judging these off of, is just like the raw base sauce, kind of minimal frills, and that's it. So let's try this. Yeah, so really strong tomato flavor. It is quite acidic um, in terms of the sweetness. It is quite sweet. And it does remind me of kind of the sauce that you would, I guess, typically get at a grocery store in terms of whatever tomato that they typically use, some kind of Roma tomato. It does have that classic tomato paste flavor, even though it is orange. I think the orange color really just brings some fruitiness to it. So it's sweet, it's acidic, it's fruity, it's really well balanced. There's good umami to it. Overall, it's just a very good sauce. I'm a big fan. So that's orange banana. Let's move on to the next one here. Let's try a red one. This one's called the Osta Valley. And I believe um, this is another Italian heirloom that's very, very similar to, I hope that's not mold, whatever that is. Some of them, unfortunately, I think do have a little bit of mold, but we'll, f we might, <laughs> we may just skip out. We may eat them. I don't know. I don't know. That doesn't look like mold to me, but the point is I made these guys couple months ago. So they've been kind of sitting in my fridge for a while. I decided I wasn't going to just wait for a friend of mine. I thought I was going to do this taste test with somebody. I just haven't had the time. 
even really to make this video. So uh, some of them might be a little bit moldy and if that's the case, I'm gonna have to probably exclude them, uh, unfortunately. But, you know, that's not a good sign, obviously, if they are molding, so. All right, this is the Austin Valley. Yeah, I think there's something wrong with that. So either that's moldy or <laughs> it's such a watered down flavor that um, the tomatoes weren't a good quality or the tomato really doesn't produce a great sauce. It just seems very like a super watered down flavor. I'm gonna put this in the discard pile and I, I would say maybe that's just how it is. I'm gonna try this other one here that should be of a similar type. So this is the Pianolo del Vesuvio and I, if I believe the Osta Valley tomato, let's look up a photo of it just so I can be 100% sure. Yeah, so I got this one from Hudson Valley Seed and uh, it's not similar as I thought to other tomatoes. This is definitely its own distinct Italian variety that doesn't have that little lip or that little nipple on the bottom of the tomato. And it says here that it gives a solid, rich flavor when roasted or preserved. So I'm not picking that up. Um, and I wonder it just by chance that the sauce has just gone bad or the tomatoes themselves weren't, weren't good. So I'm gonna hold, I guess, reserve judgment for now. The next one up here is the Pianolo del Vesuvio. And I, I just wouldn't, by the way, describe that Osta Valley is rich by any means. Yeah, so here's the Pianolo. Same thing. Very, very similar flavor. But not watered down as much. So to me, it's just a... You know, you know what I'm getting at is that these to me are just boring sauces. Like, is that what, you know, is that what it's, uh, people who use sauce want? Do you want a boring sauce? Um, yeah, whatever, that's, that's definitely not my thing. This orange banana is so incredibly flavorful that uh, I, I don't have any olive oil or salt in here and it's incredible, just on its own. Whatever, let's continue. Here's Fiaschetto. I think this is Fiaschetto di Medora, if I'm not mistaken. This is, I believe, a, a Roma type, a smaller Roma type. Let's, uh, or maybe it's a larger Roma type. Let's find out. Huh. So again, you know, blander flavor. Really not a lot of acidity, not a lot of sweetness, just even mild tomato flavor. So the, the th past three that I've had, you know, I really wasn't that impressed with because they kind of just are meh. You know, there's nothing really that's coming through the sauce that I really think is that interesting. Here's black cherry. Let's try this. This is my favorite sauce tomato, or my favorite cherry tomato, excuse me. And I figured because I had so many of them and I love the tomato so much, why not try to make it into sauce? In fact, I'm not really even seeing that many skins in here. Even just if you were to cook with this, which I typically do, this year I've been cooking a lot with those tomatoes that have that nipple on them. And I find that they really taste well. They taste great when you cook them. Um, you know, you put them in some olive oil and garlic, you saute that for a bit, use that as a base for fish or anything, and it comes out great. Um, you know, but typically I would be using, before I started growing these crazy paste tomatoes, typically the black cherry was my tomato of choice that I would cook with and eat fresh. Yeah. So that's just so much more flavorful. Like, 
that's got such a dark, rich flavor, low acidity, not so sweet, but the, the flavor is so intensely rich as a dark tomato should be. Uh, this is impressive. To me, this is extremely impressive. Um, I don't know how you wouldn't like this on a pizza. You know, this is, uh, yeah, to me, that's an incredible tomato. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I, I wonder, you know, what people are going to do with, with what people want out of their sauce, you know? Like, for me, I want the flavor to really come from the sauce, right? You really want to have a flavorful sauce. You don't want something boring, right? I mean, I guess you have this boring sauce that you then add all these ingredients like basil, you know, and olive oil and salt, and you kind of make the sauce a bit better. But this, if you ate this sauce, I'm not kidding, you ate this, and you, you typically ate ragu your whole life, you'd be blown away. The same thing with this orange banana. Like, it's, it's just like a different experience of sauce. Here's the Principe. I was most excited for this tomato and the Pianolo out of any other tomato. Smells a lot like the other ones we've tried that are kind of boring. Yeah. Same deal. Boring, watered down flavor that to me doesn't really do anything. It doesn't do anything for me. I'm not getting anything out of it. Um, so strange. People like this stuff. All right, here is uh, the 10 fingers of Naples. We got a lot of this. This I'm almost certain is a, um, is a Roma type. So this is a nice little alternative to the orange banana that's similar to a Roma, similar to the Amish paste, the San Marzano. Oh, this one's actually pretty good. This has got a good flavor. Hmm. Wow. So not as intensely flavored as the orange banana and the black cherry, but still very good. And I don't know, it's got a more of a sweetness, lower acidity, good tomato and, and, and similar-ish fruity flavors to it. So 10 fingers of Naples, that's a winner. I guess we should put all of our winners over here. All right, what do we got next? This is Canestrino, my friend Raphael claims this is the best tasting paste tomato. He says this is the best one, better than the San Marzano. This is definitely grown in Italy. It's found in sauces all over the place. This is a popular tomato. Smelling it, it smells pretty good. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a winner. It's a very good tomato. Very good tomato flavor. This to me, I would put this in a darker category of tomato, similar to the black cherry in that it produces a very flavorful, rich tomato. So far though, I find that the, the orange banana, I think has the most acidity to it. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. So that's very good. This canestrino, I'm impressed. I'm in love with that tomato, actually. That's very good. I, I struggle, though, to grow those fruits. That's not one that I think in more humid places that you, you're going to see much success with it. Although I did get a second little harvest of it. You know, being the indeterminate type that it is, it just kept producing. The plant really wasn't doing that well this year, but it did produce a lot of fruits. I mean, that's a lot of sauce. Um, Although, to be honest with you, some of these other ones way outproduce it. And I think uh, in this humid climate, it's pretty difficult. This one's called Midnight Roma. And uh, this is a, a row seven seed. So row seven really is the big, uh, 
company that's partnered up with different farmers and different chefs and people like that to then breed tomatoes, not just tomatoes, but breed crops that have better flavor to them. I mean, that's what their whole thing is. So this should be the best one, right? They're working together with the chefs. They're working together with people who should know what they're talking about. And this should be the best one. It's a, it's a dark red tomato with a really dark black purplish blush to it. And if you read the description on their website, it said, it's said to create a really rich tomato experience. What I did notice about this tomato as I was cooking it, and this was the last one I, I harvested and made in the sauce, so this is the most fresh of the bunch, is that it, um, it, it cooks extremely quickly. And I wonder if that's because I didn't have many tomatoes to cook, but it was a very, very quick cooking process. And maybe that's partly why they chose it, um, to, you know, to offer it up to chefs, because they want the tomatoes that cook quickly, right? they're not trying to spend all day making sauce. Um, so this one broke down real quickly and turned into sauce really quickly. Uh, let's try it. Hmm. Interesting. So this one's a little salty. And there is olive oil in here. So this one I think is cheating a little bit. Because it is a little bit better in that sense. But, yeah. I think the olive oil is kind of distorting it a little bit for me, but that's not bad. I mean, that's a good tomato. I would put this in the keeper category. It's not as flavorful, though, as some of these others that we have in here. Maybe it's on the same level as the Ten Fingers of Naples but it's way more flavorful than these other ones. This, by the way, I have here is a full jar. This is just mixed. So I've put all my tomatoes together over the, the course of the season, mix them together and just cook them down. And that's kind of what I, what I got, is you get this darker red sauce typically, depends on the tomatoes you use, but it, uh, it's pretty good. And um, yeah, I mean, might as well try it, right? Why not? So this has got even beef steaks in it. This has got sauced tomatoes that are, their purpose is sauce. If I can get it open. So this has got every tomato in the book and I even throw in the olive oil. Yeah. Actually has a little bit of a burnt taste to it. So I may, may have messed this batch up, but very flavorful. And um, it also has a, a, the most tomato flavor, I think, out of the whole bunch here, which is insane, uh, I guess to say. So there's a lot of tomato coming out of that. All right, here's the San Marzano, right? I guess we should save this one for last. I'm saving this one for last. Here's one called Chile Verde, which uh, produces a green paste. It's a green tomato. And it kind of looks like salsa just on its own. Like I cooked it down and there wasn't a ton of uh, liquid. I guess I cooked it down too much and that's kind of why. But um, this is more like a relish or something rather than, it looks like a relish to me, rather than a tomato paste. Uh, it's so thick and uh, chunky. Whoa. So that's very different. Very, very, very different. This is like, really, it does remind me of like a salsa verde. It doesn't taste like sauce at all. This tastes like salsa without any other ingredients. Um, so I'm gonna say, I don't really know what you would do this, what you would use this for, to be perfectly honest, other than making a salsa. So for me, I was hoping for some interesting sauce, but this has got the acidity and the salsa flavor to it that you want. 
Well, I think that would make a really good salsa verde, actually. That's pretty impressive. It's a green tomato. Yeah, I'm interested. Okay. Here we have white tomasol. And I was so impressed with this tomato, but there's mold in it. So that's a real shame. But this is a white tomato. And I was so impressed by it that I decided that I would try it, as, try it out as a sauce and see what would happen. Turns out, I don't know. <laughs> because I think, because uh, there's mold, so we won't know. But I do have another white tomato here called pork chop. This is another one. So white tomasol and pork chop really impressed me as white tomatoes. I also really like the Napa Chardonnay. Just in our trials of you know, eating these tomatoes fresh, this had uh, really impressed me. Really the three of those, and even Barry's Crazy Cherry. So here's pork chop. I think we have salt and some olive oil in here. Hmm. Man. I really do think that was a mistake adding the salt and the olive oil because it just distorts the flavor so much and it makes it taste very similar, I think. But yeah, it's, it's a different kind of sauce, that's for sure. On the chunkier side, um, sweeter. Less acidity and very fruity. And that's kind of typically what you find out of these white tomatoes is that they're, I think, a little lower personally in acidity and they're typically very fruity. And that's kind of what I got out of this. I don't know. This is so sweet to me. Like, you know, some people grow up and they eat sauce and, um, you know, they have a very, very sweet sauce growing up. Like typically some ragus are like, typically the American kid eating sauce is like very sweet and they add a lot of sugar to it and they really sweeten up the sauce. And that to me just is just so sweet that I can't eat it. Like, because I grew up not eating sweet sauce, but some people grew up eating very sweet sauce and they love the sweeter sauce. So I don't know, for me, I think, I don't want any minimal sweetness in my sauce. And to me, I think that just weirds me out. So I think it's good uh, in its own little way, but it's not for me. So here's the striped Roman. This is a Roman tomato that's got really nice striping on it. And uh, this has got a really good reputation to it. I know that. This is all, yeah, it's like a, a paste tomato, true paste tomato that's not shaped like a cherry, shaped like a Roma. Again, it's got some good tomato flavor, but it is a bit on the blander side. But I would argue, out of these blander bunch over here of these red tomatoes, these red Italian heirlooms, this one's the, a better, uh, better one of that bunch. So I actually like this, but it's not as rich or flavorful as any of these other ones over here. Here's the purple Russian. This is a dark purple tomato, Roma type. Again, I was trying to go for these different colors to see if I could get something rich, something different, something interesting. Let's try this. I think there's no olive oil on this. Huh. Wow. This is a very good tomato. Um, very interesting. How do I even describe this? You know what? This is very earthy. Not very sweet. Not that acidic. Uh, it's not even that rich. There's tomato flavor and it's extremely earthy. I think this actually is a very good, very good paste tomato for sauce. Something a little different. Um, again, I don't know typically, uh, you know, what you would use this for, 
um, what dish, but I could personally, I want to experiment with food and different pairings of food with this for sure. As with this pork chop or some kind of white tomato, I would like to see how that kind of lines up with each other because they're, they're very different um, than the rest. Here's Frank's Iranian. We looked at this one outside. Uh, here's a missing lid. <laughs> here's a missing lid. I've been missing lids this whole time. And there was two lids on that one. I wonder if these, this is a missing lid too. <laughs> I've been missing lids guys on these ball jars. It turns out I had two lids on the same thing. Ain't that interesting. So this should be very similar to the others. And uh, I've been eating a lot of the Frank's Iranian this year. This is a good producer, held up to the disease. Same thing with the Grappoli, the Inverno. Oh, oh, okay. So this is quite good. And maybe this is more representative of what we should be seeing from these other ones here that I didn't like, like the Principe Borghese, like the, uh, oh, maybe like the Fiaschetto. I have to look at a photo of that, but definitely like the Pianola as well. This, um, this plant, maybe the Osta Valley as well, but this particular plant I know did well. None of the tomatoes taste good. I've been cooking with them. This is what they taste like when you cook them. It's very good. Great tomato flavor. It's extremely well balanced. And you can tell. No wonder. It's got good umami to it. It's got good richness to it. Everything about it is extremely well balanced. For me, this is a winner. Um, I don't know. This is some tough decisions because we got some good tomatoes here. This is a rising shrub here. And these tomatoes did not do well. The plant didn't do well. I didn't like the plant. I didn't like the tomatoes. And I decided, well, let's try to sauce and see what happens. It molded. All right, here's the Amish paste. This is a really well-known paste tomato. We actually have four more after this. I'm not screwing around here, guys. Amish paste. This one might have some olive oil in it. Good tomato flavor. Boring. Not watered down, though. So as a blander paste tomato, if that's what you want, you don't want something super flavorful, Something well balanced. Well, it's not bad. You know? I'm putting this in the same category, I guess, as Frank's. Of just a general, overall, good tomato. Here's the Grappoli, the Inverno. We looked at that, and you know what? I remember specifically, when I was making these, I was going to make more of it. Because I remember the tomatoes themselves weren't that great, and I figured... If the tomatoes aren't that great, it probably isn't going to make a great sauce. Well, yeah, it's not making a great sauce, but it's not horrible. So I have to reserve judgment on that. I do believe, though, because it is so similar, it's going to taste just like the Franks. I cook it up. I taste it. It just... The whole thing, I think, is very similar to Frank's. I don't know really of a big difference. Here is the Legenda Tarasenko, I believe is how it's called. Oh, wait, we got some mold up here, so that's not good. Can't eat that. Black mold. Not good. But this is a, uh, you know, this is a paste tomato that is more of a Roma type, if I'm not mistaken, with a weird kind of shape to it. And then here is uh, one of our last ones. It's called Goose Creek. This is also a beefsteak. 
and I was growing this tomato with the purposes or the intentions in mind to use this as a tomato to replace pink brandy wine. I was trying to find a, a tomato similar to pink brandy wine for fresh eating, for slicing, for whatever, that would also outproduce it and taste similar. And I don't think it does that, but I thought so highly of it this year, again, I decided to make it in the sauce. Just like the pork chop, just like the white toma sole, I figured let's see what happens because this tomato has the most, this, this tomato has the most tomato flavor of any other tomato I've, uh, I've tasted, I think. Oh yeah. Holy crap. Loads of umami. Loads of tomato flavor. Very rich. Extremely rich. Uh, I think, personally, this is a very, very, very good tomato. For paste, for all kinds of things. Even the uh, skins, just cooking them down, there isn't that many skins I'm seeing in here. Lots of seeds. But overall, this is a very, very good sauce. Um, wow. Hmm. Well, there it is. Um, that's Goose Creek. I've got to put it in the keeper pile for sure. And then lastly is the San Marzano. This plant did produce well. It grew well. The tomatoes that we got to taste or that we got to use in the sauce are of a higher quality. I should be expecting good things. I do think there is some olive oil in here. Yeah, 100%. Hmm. I think there's too much of that olive oil in here. But it's not mind-blowingly good, you know. Uh, this I did notice cooks down very fast. And there's also a um, many different types of San Marzano. And this one is the one that is supposed to be the best. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. I think it's Lunga or something. But this is typically the strain of San Marzano that people really, really like and rave about. It's good. I'm not going to lie. It's good. But is it the best one? No, it's not. 